Welcome to this tutorial in which we will look at the theory of religion offered by Edward Tyler, a British anthropologist and the father of cultural anthropology. Just before we begin, I want to make a quick disclaimer, just that Tyler does use some offensive colonial terminologies when he developed his ideas. He was a man of his time when the colonialists were discovering new non-European cultures, which were, of course, oftentimes viewed as inferior so we find, admittedly, offensive references to them as savages, primitives, and uncivilized by certain theorists. Tyler is one such theorist. So this is just a heads up to those viewers who might be sensitive to such things, which will no doubt crop up in this analysis. Nonetheless, moving on, Tyler did conceive of influential theories of cultural evolution, much of which was inspired by Charles Darwin, and some of which include the evolution of religious belief. It is in respect to Tyler's ideas concerning the evolution of religious belief that has been of interest to scholars of religion. Tyler believed that religion can be approached in an objective scientific sense because religions themselves attempt to provide an objective account and explanation of the world. In other words, religious claims can either square with reality or they can fail in light of it. Re religions are open to being compared to objective reality and measured against empirical observation. This approach to religion lies behind Tyler's evolutionary, evolutionary chronicle of human culture and religious belief, as well as his theory of animism as the most primitive religious belief. Important here is Tyler's book called The Primitive Culture, or Primitive Culture, which was published in 1871. This work is broken down into two volumes, namely The Origins of Culture and Religion in Primitive Culture. The first volume is primarily ethnographical and deals with topics of the topics of linguistics, myth, and social evolution. The second volume, Religion and Primitive Culture, deals with religious belief and the theory of animism in which Tyler's primary purpose was to understand the religious life of the primitive peoples. He argues that animistic beliefs constituted the earliest religious belief and that these beliefs came into existence as a result of the projection of ordinary experiences of powerful people onto a supernatural realm. One example is that people came to believe that the world was created by the gods or a god because they witnessed people making things in their daily experience, and thus projected this onto the cosmos and the supernatural. Tyler notes how religions and religious believers frequently invoke the existence of spirits, souls, and gods to explain events in the world. This provided for him what he deemed an obvious fact, namely that religion involves belief in spirits and spirit agencies. This is especially so in the so-called primitive tribes of the hunter-gatherers, whom Tyler believed to be at a lower level in cognitive development than modern humans. It is always relevant to take into consideration the background of a particular theorist because this can inform why he reasons the way he does. In this sense, in this sense it is very difficult to miss Tyler's obvious disdain for religion despite his religious Quaker background. Tyler grew to dislike religion, which he came to see as grounded in error. Religion failed to square with objective reality in his view. Tyler had a particularly negative view of the church, especially the Church of England, as well as of the Roman Catholics. As scholar of religion Ivan Strensky has argued, it is likely that these sentiments influenced Tyler's animistic theory of religion. After all, Tyler was well aware that Christianity teaches and affirms the existence of one God. But if his animistic theory is true, then it would undermine the uniqueness and truth of this teaching. He reasoned that if all beliefs in and about God had merely evolved from a so-called primitive early form of animism, then no religious belief held by anyone in the modern day, including those within the church, could be considered truer or superior to any other. They are all equally superstitious. Using one example, Tyler argued that the beliefs held by Mexican Catholics resembled the so-called primitive ones shared by the ancient animists. He specifically points out the similarities the Catholics have with the behaviors of the animistic people who communicated with gods as a means to obtain their favor and for success in their enterprises. 
It is also important to note Tyler's philosophical convictions. He held the universe to be inanimate and impersonal, and therefore he did not find a need to appeal to supernatural forces to explain it. Tyler did not believe that God was behind theology either. In his view, religious doctrines and practices belong to theological systems devised by humans without supernatural aid or revelation. Theological beliefs also have their origin in animism. As Tyler writes, the conception of the human soul is, as to its most essential nature, continuous from the philosophy of the savage thinker to that of the modern professor of theology. Religion exists simply because it is in human nature to be religious. This, of course, does not mean religion squares with objective reality. A view which led Tyler to claim that one need not explain the manifestations of religion through an appeal to the supernatural, or to God or the gods. Tyler stated his goal to engage in a systematic study of the religions of the lower races. This led him to produce a rudimentary definition of religion, which he defined as belief in spiritual beings. In his own words, he writes, It seems best to fall back at once on this essential source, and simply to claim, as a minimum definition of religion, that religion is the belief in spiritual beings. Tyler then turns to the topic of animism, a subject he deals with in his book Primitive Culture. Broadly understood, animism is ascribing personal agency to inanimate, inanimate objects and using spirits, souls, or gods to explain phenomena within the world. Tyler phrases his view of animism as follows. I propose here, under the name of animism, to investigate the deep lying doctrine of spiritual beings, which embodies the very essence of spiritualistic, as opposed to materialistic, philosophy. An animist, in Tyler's view, is a person who holds to, a, to an extreme spiritualistic view, or to the general belief in spiritual beings, who can intervene in the lives of human beings and in the natural world. Animism is opposed to materialism, which claims that all phenomena in the universe are material, or can be reduced to the material. It is animism that Tyler claims to be the earliest religion or form of religious belief. In his words, Animism characterizes tribes very low in the scale of humanity, and thence ascends, deeply modified in its transmission, but from first to last preserving an unbroken continuity, into the myths of high modern culture. Employing colonial terminology, terminology, terminology that would make many modern re readers uncomfortable, animism, animism was the religion of the savages, that continued to evolve up until the age of so-called civilized men. Again, Tyler appeals to evidence, writing that in light of the immense mass of accessible evidence, we have to admit that the belief in spiritual beings appears among all low races. Tyler divided animism into two great dogmas. The first dogma concerns that of belief in the soul of individual creatures that are capable of existing after the death of death or destruction of the body. The second dogma concerns spirits that exist in a hierarchy, upward to the rank of powerful deities. For the religious, spirits are believed to have life, be active, and respond to human beings. As Tyler writes, spiritual beings are hold to affect or control the events of the material world, and man's life here and hereafter, and it is being considered that they hold intercourse with men, and receive pleasure or displeasure from human actions. The belief in their existence leads natural, and it might almost be said inevitably, inevitably sooner or later, to active reverence and propitiation. Tyler's definition of animism thus includes a belief in souls, in controlling deities, and a hierarchy of subordinate spirits. There, is further consideration, there are further considerations concerning Tyler's notion of animism. Tyler offers several ideas when it comes to his explanation concerning the development of animism within the primitive peoples. For example, he was interested in dreams. He believed that the primitive peoples experienced their dreams in such a compelling way that they really felt like they were moving in a spiritual space where bodies are not needed. It is almost as if there are no limitations. In a dream, one can, for example, observe other things happening. One can fly, pass through wars. 
engage in battle, move from place to place at will, and much more, all, all of which feel very real. According to Tyler, many primitive cultures interpreted dreams as being real experiences of things actually happening. It is because of this belief that the so-called primitive peoples came to believe that two things belong to them, namely a life and a phantom. According to Tyler, the life and the phantom are closely connected with the body. The life enables the body to feel, think and act, whereas the phantom is the body's image or second self. Although closely connected with the body, both are also perceived as separable from the body. Tyler suggested that the next step for these cultures was to combine the life and the, and the phantom. The life, the life and phantom now both belong to the body and are the manifestations of one and the same soul. Tyler proposed a closer and more nuanced description of this ghost soul. In his words, it is a thin, unsubstantial human image in its nature, sort of vapor, film or shadow, the cause of life and thought in the individual it animates, independently possessing the personal consciousness and volition of its corporal power, past or present, capable of leaving the body far behind, to flash swiftly from place to place, from place to place. Mostly impalpable and invisible, yet also manifesting physical power and especially appearing to men waking or asleep as phantasm, separate from the body of which it bears the likeness, continuing to exist and appear to men after the death of that body, able to enter into, possess and act in the bodies of any of other men, if of animals and even of things. But Tyler came to face a confusion. He believed that holding to animistic beliefs was was appropriate for the primitive and so-called savage peoples and societies, but he wondered why so many contemporary people still shared similar beliefs. After all, if modern people are aware of science, why do their beliefs not conform more to this intellectual progress? Most people still believe in spirits, such as Yahweh, Allah, Vishnu, and so on. Tyler came to believe that some people had become stuck at a lower stage or level of cognitive, cultural, and religious development than others. He also claimed to notice some changes in animistic beliefs as human beings became more civilized. For example, the notion of souls changed. The belief that animals have souls started dying out and the doctrine of the human soul also underwent modification. The human soul is no longer believed by the civilized mind to be associated with dreams, but is instead just deemed an immaterial entity. Animism is still a superstition that can be found in theology. There is an animistic residue that has been left over from humanity's evolution and development. So to be, begin concluding with some closing thoughts, we can note some of the criticisms of Tyler's theory of religion. It is worth noting, on the positive side for Tyler, is that his animistic theory has led some scholars to adopt a Tylorian theory of religion, simply because he really did capture within religion what is really there, namely belief in spirits. Belief in spirits is a real feature of many religions, from the likes of Hinduism and Islam to Christianity, Judaism and others. But this is also very much open to criticism, because it is less clear how Tyler's theory would apply to other religions which lack belief in spirits. For example, it's less clear how his theory would, appear, would, would apply to Taoism, Confucianism, Buddhism, or some of the atheistic religions like Raelianism. A strong critique is that Tyler underestimated the intellectual and artistic complexity of prehistorical cultures. He viewed these people as lower in their development than we are, for example. But this led Tyler to becoming blind to their creativity, such as it is evident in their artistic abilities. The artistic ability evident within the hunter-gatherer tribes and peoples suggests an intellectual command not appreciated by many later theorists, of whom Tyler is one. Further, a great swath of contemporary evidence has revealed that the prehistorical peoples were much more advanced than they have initially been given credit for. The scholar, the scholar Evans Pritchard, for example, in his study of the Nure people, argues that he uncovered a far greater level of intellectual and artistic elocution than theorists like Tyler and others have allowed. A further critique which has spawned an entire field of so-called of, of study called postcolonial and decolonial theory 
is the obvious colonial terminology and value ju judgments employed by theorists like Tyler. As post-colonial theorists have highlighted, many of these newly discovered peoples and cultures of Tyler's time and before were perceived and represented by Europeans as irrational, primitive, savage, and superstitious. And they were often placed on, the, on a lower rung of evolutionary development than Euro Europeans themselves. In religious studies, many scholars of religion are aware that the origin of their discipline developed out of an intellectual and geopolitical context of conquest. This has led some of them to advocate for positive liberty, and to encourage a respect for local knowledge and the practices of indigenous, indigenous men and women. These are some of the more obvious criticisms of Tyler's theory, but there are many other criticisms we can offer. For example, Tyler letting his philosophical convictions and biases dictate his process of theorization. But in order to draw this tutorial to a close, we will end there on those few criticisms. All in all, Tyler's views have been influential, they are still engaged in the academic study of religion, and Tylorian phrases and terminology will crop up in many writings. It's important that we acknowledge Tyler's influence and some of his views. Just because he had his biases, this does not mean that his views are necessarily wrong there's likely some truth to it, to it. But we also need to hold theories of religion that look for origins tentatively, simply because there is indeed a lack of evidence. And much of the, m many of the hypothetical scenarios of, of attempting to explain early religion are speculative. 